you have to have a pretty good discipline or system for budgeting and knowing how your money is going in and out. Because the way that you get most of your points is through the sign-up bonuses. For example, you might get 100,000 points if you spend at least $4,000 in three months. Before you get that card, you should have a plan for how to do that $4,000. Maybe open this card right before you have to remodel a kitchen or buy a new car, pay a tuition payment, something where it's money you would have spent anyway, and you can get that sign-up bonus for the money you were going to spend. You're listening to Yo Quiero Dinero, a personal finance podcast for the modern Latina. I'm your host, Janice Torres Rodriguez, personal finance expert, speaker, writer, and business coach. I teach women of color how to build wealth and gain financial independence through side hustles and investing. On this show, we're serving up POC-friendly personal finance knowledge, always with a side of sass. We're talking about how to make dinero, how to keep it, and how to make it grow. If you're ready to become poderosa with your dinero, you've come to the right place. Hola, mi gente. Welcome back to Yo Quiero Dinero, the podcast. This is your host, Janice, and you are listening to episode 117, Travel Hacking for Beginners with Julia Menez of GeoBreeze Travel. Julia is a travel hacking coach, speaker, and host of the GeoBreeze Travel podcast. After traveling to over 30 countries before the age of 30 and saving thousands of dollars each year by travel hacking, Julia distills the strategies from top travel hackers around the world on her GeoBreeze Travel podcast and prepares personalized points and miles plans for her private coaching clients. Through her podcast, Julia features a diverse roster of guests with experiences that are traditionally underrepresented in larger points and miles blogs and media. Her episodes often highlight travel hacking women, immigrants, or people of color. Travel hacking is something that I didn't even realize was a thing until I thought back to my childhood and realized we used to travel quite a lot and it's because my dad was a travel hacker before I even knew that that was a thing. As a kid, my dad traveled a lot because he worked in the consulting field and I never realized that all of the traveling that he was doing was actually benefiting us. So as a kid, we did travel quite a bit and he would tack on his business trips to family vacations and would get points from credit cards. And I had no idea that travel hacking was a thing until I realized that my family had been doing it for a very long time. So... If one of your goals for 2022 is to start travel hacking more and figuring out how you can use things like credit cards and rewards programs for getting flights, hotel deals, and more on the cheap, do not change the channel. This is the episode for you. Before we hop into today's conversation, I want to remind you to follow us on social. If you're loving this podcast and you want more community, you want to find out more about our events and all the stuff that we have going on behind the scenes. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and everywhere else you love to hang out on the internet. If you're loving this podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review if you listen to us on Apple. It's the easiest way to share our podcast with people that you know and love, and it helps us get discovered by amazing listeners like you. So take a moment, leave us a review, share us with your friends and family, subscribe so that you never miss an episode, and make sure to check out our blog, YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com, where you can sign up for our email list and you'll never miss an episode. Plus, you get exclusive invitations to our live events, special discounts for our digital courses, and as always, our best personal finance tips and advice to help you be poderosa with your dinero. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get into the episode. Julia, welcome to the podcast. It is such an honor to have you here. Hey, Janice. I am so excited to be here today. (laughs) Yes. So I am an avid traveler, but I realize I don't have a ton of travel hacking info on the podcast and also on my blog. And it's also probably because I'm still figuring out how this whole thing works. So I'm super excited that we're going to talk today. And I would love for you to start off with an introduction of who you are. Hey, everybody. My name is Julia Menez. I am the host of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. I'm also a points and miles strategy coach for people who are trying to figure out how to even get into the game, aspiring Instagram influencer, and I like to dabble in all of the different kinds of ways that you can make money in this space and on the internet related to points and miles. So that's a little bit about what I do outside of my day job. In my day job, I actually just quit my job and then I'm starting a new one in a couple weeks. I am an actuary. So very math 
based. Wow. I'm an actuarial consultant. And when you become an actuary, you have to take all of these certification exams and you're just used to like spending your nights and weekends on that. And then one day you're certified and you're done. And then you're like, well, I guess I'll start a side gig so that I can <laughs> keep using all of those like night and weekend brain cells. Wow. Okay. So actuary does not equate to me as an, a career that like allows you to travel a ton, but maybe I'm wrong. So can you talk me kind of through how you got into travel hacking and, you know, how you, maybe your career played into that? Yeah. So I was reading all of these personal finance blogs back in the day, just the usual ones from five years ago, Mr. Money Mustache, Afford Anything, Go Curry Cracker, all of those. And they kept talking about how you can travel for free using credit cards. And I thought the same thing as everybody else of this is a scam. This is clearly a scam where you're signing up for credit cards and then you get free travel and clearly something is going to come back to bite you later. But I kept reading more and more into it. And so many different blogs kept mentioning this. And I thought, okay, we're going to slowly step into this, maybe get one or two cards. So my husband and I got a couple cards and we were actually traveling to Morocco, just using money, not even points. And we had this tour booked. The same guy was handling our excursions, our hotels, our transportation to five different cities in Morocco. And about 20 hours before we took our flight, he had to cancel on us because there was a family emergency. So we were about to land in Morocco and had nothing. We had nothing. So I had just earned a sign-up bonus on my first card. And I called American Express. It was the Starwood card back in the day and said, hey, I can get a free hotel, right? Like that's how this works because I have nowhere to stay. And they said, yep, you have enough points for three nights at the Sheraton Casablanca. It's our only hotel in the area. And I said, perfect, we'll take that. And we walked into the hotel. It was super nice. And I thought, there is, again, no way this actually is going to work. They're going to laugh at us. But it worked. We had our free room. They upgraded us because I had status due to having that credit card. It came with free breakfast and cocktail hour and everything. And so from there, was very hooked on the whole getting to travel for free. And from the career side, I actually studied abroad in China when it I was about to graduate, so the summer before graduation, and I just thought I really would like a job that let me travel the world. And so there are some international actuaries who get to travel around and do like set up systems, be a chief actuary in a foreign location, and I kept trying to go for those jobs at work because we had a global department. And they kept saying, you have to move to Delaware. And I said, why? And I didn't want to move to Delaware. I just wanted to move straight to Thailand. And so those jobs were very hard to get. And I really just wanted for somebody else to pay for me to travel. So travel hacking was great because then I didn't have to depend on my job to do it. And eventually I got into the global department and we lost all of our funding for travel because of the pandemic. So good thing. Funny how that works out. (laughs) Yeah. Good thing I have points and miles for that. But there is a part of actuarial science where you can do consulting, where you might be doing a lot of domestic travel, possibly international travel, just for meeting with clients who need health benefits set up or retirement benefits set up or something like that. And so you can earn quite a few points and miles just by living a consultant lifestyle and then use those however you would like on your days off. So I'm moving to the consulting world now. Got it. Okay. So I just from my own knowledge, an actuary, is that like those people that determine like when insurance policies, like how likely they are to get paid out and things like that? Like, what do they do? A little bit, yes. So there's different kinds of actuaries. I've mostly been in the healthcare pricing world to determine which demographics are being overcharged or undercharged and how do we recalibrate. There are some who work with financial solvency, some who do more risk assessment. So there's actually lots of different kinds. I work in health. There's some who do life insurance, some who do auto and home insurance, lots of different types. Okay. Now I'm curious, were you a kid that traveled a lot? Like for me, my dad was a consultant for basically the majority of his career. And so he would tie a lot of our family travel into his business travel. And so I got to travel probably much more than like the average kid. And I think that for me was definitely the spark that was lit within me that I'm like, I love this and I want to do this forever. So what was it for you? Like, what was your experience with travel as a kid? 
We got to take a vacation to go back to the Philippines approximately once every eight years. We would just save up money for eight years because my parents didn't really know about points and miles. And there were five of us in the family. So five plane tickets to the Philippines. That's at least $5,000. So we would just save up for eight years and then go. And that was pretty much it. I think we had a Disney World trip somewhere in there and then a California trip somewhere in there. And that was it for the first 18 years of my life. And I loved getting to be on that plane. I loved getting to see the other side of the world. I loved being able to do study abroad and have that opportunity when I was in college. But really, all of my travel, I've been to more than 30 countries now, all of it almost has been after age 22. Once I had my own financial independence, got my own credit cards and paid for it for myself. Yeah, I love that. Okay. So you mentioned financial independence, which, you know, is tied to this idea of travel hacking. That's how a lot of us kind of encounter this concept in the beginning. So how did you first come upon the uh, idea or the concept of financial independence? Was it by accident? Were you introduced to it by someone? Or was it because you were searching about this travel hacking and then you found out about the greater world of financial independence? So it was the other way around. I knew about the greater world of financial independence, which led me into travel hacking. And I heard about the FI blogs and everything from my husband, just from um, his friends, where somebody at work was saying, oh, you should read into these blogs. And then he came home and said, I think you might like these blogs and it might keep you entertained reading them. And he had no idea how deep I was going to go. I'm like, so... I binge read everything. It kept me entertained more than Netflix. I read so much about financial independence and then said, okay, we have to set up our Vanguard stuff. We have to do mega backdoor, Roth IRA. I have to do all of the credit card games. So I dove really deep. And And how long ago was that? (laughs) That was probably five years ago at this point. Okay. So what has your FIRE journey consisted of and what is your ultimate goal from a financial independence standpoint? So we've been work optional for a few years now and we've actually talked about should we just retire? What should we do? If I were not gainfully employed, I think I would drive both me and my husband insane, which is why I also have so many side gigs in the evenings and on weekends. But the journey for us we had a lot of advantages because we both had almost full ride scholarships to college. So we graduated without debt. And then we both have two high paying incomes that, well, we each have a high paying income. I'm an actuary. He's a software engineer. And we had a naturally frugal lifestyle anyway. I'm first generation, grew up in Missouri. His family was from South Dakota. So kind of like that Midwest frugality. And we generally would just live off of my income and save or invest his. So, And he made a little bit more than I did. So it was about a 50% savings rate. And just being able to put that into savings or investments every year, we got to be work optional pretty quickly, especially as we were both getting raises year over year. When you're an actuary, each exam, each certification exam you pass gets you a couple thousand dollars in raises and bonuses every year. And there's 10 of those now. So it'll really add up. And even though we've been work optional or FI, it's been kind of interesting because I keep finding these different new streams of income that are just interesting to me where I said, oh, I want to do a podcast just because I want to talk to people about points and miles or, oh, I wonder how people make money doing brand deals on Instagram. I wonder if I can do that. And so it's been opening up a lot more different streams of income just because I'm curious of, is this a real thing that people can do on the internet? Kind of like with the whole travel hacking thing where I was just curious, is this something that could work for me? I, I want to try it. Oh, it works. Cool. Yeah. Do you guys live in a low cost of living area or are you just, like you mentioned, naturally frugal? So we lived in Colorado for about seven years, one bedroom apartment. And I think what really helps is I like to cook as one of my other hobbies. I cook at home a lot. I struggle with shopping in that I can never find anything that I like. And (laughs) I've just been wearing the same clothes for the last 10 years. It's actually something I'm trying to be better at is to find nicer clothes that look like what adults should be wearing. But then the pandemic, I'm like, oh, I'm in style again. I have my gym shorts and I have my stretchy t-shirts. We're all good. So we just 
couldn't ever find things that we wanted to spend money on. And eventually we said, we want to spend money on travel. But then I figured out travel hacking. So we didn't have to spend money on travel. So we were very naturally frugal in that sense. And then eventually we moved out here to New Jersey, which is a much higher cost of living. We're in Jersey City right across from Manhattan. So it's a higher cost of living, but as a percentage of the income that we make, because the pay scale is a little bit higher out here, we still live off of my income and save his. Mm -hmm. I love that. Welcome to Jersey. I grew up there, born and raised. And I feel like it's definitely one of those places, like if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. (laughs) So the fact that you're still able to pursue financial independence is pretty awesome. Okay, so let's get into the travel hacking because I feel like there's just so many different ways to do it. There's so many credit cards. There's like, do you want to do flights? Do you want to do hotels? Do you want to, I don't know, use cash and convert it to points? It's like so overwhelming. So for like the beginner who just wants to dip their toe in, what's your best advice as to how to get started? I would say pick a goal and work backwards from there. Because like you said, there's so many different credit cards. And I think a lot of people start with, oh, should I get the Amex Platinum or the Chase Sapphire Preferred or the Marriott Bonvoy? And then they start reading all of the terms and conditions of 30 different credit cards, which is awful. So don't do that. Do the exact opposite where you tell yourself, my dream trip is Japan. And then go to Google Flights and see who flies from your home airport to Japan which airlines are those? What kind of points do you need? How many points would you need to do that flight? And then you can figure out which credit cards can get you those kinds of points. And is that enough points or do you need more than one credit card? So working backwards from there can give you such a more focused approach. And then you also won't fall victim to what I call shiny card syndrome, where sometimes there will be, oh, here's a Hilton card for 130,000 points, even though Hilton points are worth very little. Not all points are created equal. And so sometimes when people are just like, oh, here's a good mail-in offer, here's another good mail-in offer, then suddenly you've applied for five or 10 cards with all different kinds of points currencies that won't pool together, and then you can't get any of the good prizes or free trips. So just working backwards and deciding where you want to go before you just start applying for cards will save so much time and effort and frustration. Yeah. And I imagine you definitely want to be intentional about your approach because there is a little bit of a ding on your credit whenever you do open a new card, right? And if you find yourself like opening five, six, seven credit cards a year, that's going to show up as a negative on your credit report. And depending on what else you could be trying to do with your money, like, you know, getting a house or something, they could they could potentially deny you if you have too many of those recent inquiries. So I like the fact that you're like, let's start with the goal versus getting the card and then figuring out what you're going to do with it. Now, I also feel like credit card hacking requires a certain level of discipline, especially when we're talking about like paying off whatever it is that you're buying to get those points. So what's your advice from that perspective? Because I know I have had a love-hate relationship with credit cards because of this. And I feel like it's just, you have to know yourself. You're absolutely right. So the first rule of travel hacking is you have to pay off your credit cards in full every month. Just set it to automatically be paid. Because if you don't, and you're carrying a balance from month to month, you have to pay interest. And those interest payments are going to completely negate any of the benefits that you get from points and miles. It It's like 20% APR most of the time. These are some of the highest interest credit cards out on the market. So make sure you're paying it off in full. And then secondly, you have to have a pretty good discipline or system for budgeting and knowing how your money is going in and out. Because the way that you get most of your points is through the signup bonuses. For example, you might get 100,000 points if you spend at least $4,000 in three months. Before you get that card, you should have a plan for how to do that $4,000. Maybe open this card right before you have to remodel a kitchen or buy a new car, pay a tuition payment, something where it's money you would have spent anyway, and you can get that sign-up bonus for the money you were going to spend. You don't want to end up in a situation where you spend $3,000 and then you say, oh, the three months is almost up. I guess I'm going to buy $1,000 worth of stuff I don't need from Amazon just to get these credit card points because that's a waste of $1,000. You also don't want to fall into the trap of oh, that's a $500 coat. I don't need that coat, but I could get 500 points if I buy that coat. And then suddenly you're buying things you don't need just because you think you can get points. 500 points, by the way, is normally worth about $5. So you should 
not do that. Oh, wow. Okay. It's good to know that the points are not the equivalent of a dollar, y'all. <laughs> it's generally one to two cents. Wow. Okay. That definitely puts things in perspective. Okay. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you think that people are making when it comes to credit card hacking? And maybe you can share one that you've made along your journey. Yeah. I would say people fall on one end of the spectrum or the other. And it's hard for people to find that happy balance. So there are people who either are saying, credit cards are the devil. I don't want to learn any of this. This is clearly a scam. And they're missing out on so many different opportunities that they could have for free travel if they just take the time to learn how the system works. So that's one side of mistakes. And then the other side is people who just dive super deep without doing their research. And they're like, I've heard that you can like do all of these chargebacks or like maybe I'll just do like cash advances to get points. Absolutely don't do that. we are like, oh, I can get a referral bonus. I'll just change my name from Julia to Leah and then I'll just refer myself to credit cards. Don't do that. That's awful. So people go from I have no way of doing this to let's figure out how to commit low key financial fraud to get more points. And there's a happy medium in there where you can get a lot of points and miles by strategically figuring out how to time when to open these credit cards, which credit card to use on particular expenses, where you're getting the points and miles, but you also don't have to worry about the IRS putting you in jail for <laughs> credit card scams. Yeah, it's not a vibe, y'all. <laughs> you don't want to get arrested on your way home from the airport because you committed fraud for your trip. Okay. Right. Right. <laughs> Okay. So I imagine like, you know, you're constantly opening these cards. Are you leaving them open or are you like using them for their sign up bonus and then closing them out? Or does it depend? So it depends. If it's a no annual fee card where it's just free, stick it in a sock drawer, put a reminder on your calendar to buy a piece of candy or something every six months so it doesn't get shut down due to inactivity. Because if they close down a credit line, that's bad for your credit because of the utilization ratio. The utilization ratio is how much credit you're using divided by how much credit you have available to you. And you want that percentage to be pretty low, somewhere between zero and 10%. And that's where credit card hacking actually can really help you is with your utilization. Because if you're opening up more and more credit cards, your ratio will go down and your credit score will go up. So if it's a no annual fee card, just keep it open. If there is an annual fee, you want to make sure you can justify it each year. For example, a lot of the hotel co-branded credit cards, Marriott, Hyatt, they'll have a fee of about $100 each year, but it comes with a free hotel night each year. So as long as you're going to be staying in at least one Marriott anyway, and that Marriott is going to cost at least $100, which is pretty much all of them, the card will pay for itself each year. There is also a thing called churning, where you want to get the sign-up bonus more than once. So for example, with the Chase Sapphire Preferred, you can get that sign-up bonus every 48 months. So what some people will do when it's about 47 months, they'll downgrade the card to a free version, and then they'll reopen or reapply for a new version of their Chase Sapphire Preferred, so that way they can get the 100,000 points again. And that's another strategy where people can get a lot more points is just by churning. Okay. Excellent advice. Okay, so you mentioned that there is an annual fee for most of these cards. Um, and I imagine that as, as the annual fee goes up, you get more bonuses or you get more perks, but you have to actually know what you're paying for. So what, in your opinion, is a card that is worth paying the annual fee for? And what are some of the benefits that you get from that card? One of the easiest ones that I think is worth paying the annual fee is those hotel cards, like the Hyatt card, because I'm going to be staying in at least one Hyatt each year anyway, and it's going to be at least $95. It pays for itself. One that makes it a little bit more complicated is the Amex Platinum, which people are starting to refer to as a luxury coupon book because it's getting harder and harder for people to justify that annual fee, which is up to $700 per year, wow. by the way. It's hard if you're a beginner in this. I can easily get more than $700 worth because you get $200 of airline credit, $200 of hotel credit, 200 of Uber, Uber Eats credit. And then you have all of these different Amex offers where you can get maybe a $100 gift card to Best Buy or to Home Depot. And so all of these things together will add up to more than $700 for me. 
But if somebody is new to the game and they're forgetting to set up their lounge access or they forget to take advantage of the $200 credit here or there, then suddenly they paid $700 and didn't get much out of it. So that's one where I would say is a more advanced card to make sure that you can justify the annual fee before you just jump in and say, oh, well, the fancy people have an Amex Platinum. I should get one too because then I'm a real travel hacker. That's probably (laughs) level two. Yeah, it's like this is a a journey, y'all. Like you have to start from the beginning and really just start to educate yourself the same way that you would when you're learning about personal finance. You have to work your way up to that that level of travel hacking. All right. So I know that there's several different credit cards that or credit card companies that they have like a travel portal that you can actually book through their website. Do you recommend using those portals to book your travel or do you recommend just going directly to the provider with the hotel or the airline or does it depend? It very much depends and you need to do the math. So for example, with Chase, if you have a Chase Sapphire Preferred, which is one of the most popular cards for beginners, if you use their portal, which looks like Expedia, except it's charging you points instead of money. If you use their portal, you will always get 1.25 cents of value per point. If you transfer it, then it's going to depend. So for example, if you transfer it to Marriott, that's a bad move because Marriott points are generally worth half a cent. So you just took 1.25 cents worth of points and then you made it half that, if that. Or if you transferred it out to Hyatt, that's a good move because Hyatt points are generally worth about 1.7 cents when you're redeeming. And the way that you calculate the value of a point for a hotel room or a flight, you look at what's the cash price for it divided by what's the points price for it. That's going to give you your cents per point ratio. And then you just compare that against the portal versus if you were to transfer out. Generally, a lot of the flights, especially if you're flying business or first class, those are where you're going to find a lot of the really high redemption cents per point values. All right. Excellent advice. Okay, so when we were first discussing how you were introduced to travel hacking, you mentioned blogs like Mr. Money Mustache, and I think of like the points guy, and there's this recurring theme that I'm seeing where there's just a lot of white men talking about award hacking and travel hacking, and I know you're very passionate about increasing the level of diversity and inclusion in this space to normalize the idea that, yes, people of color, we can travel, we can travel hack, we can do all these things. So talk to me about the work that you're doing and what you think the greater personal finance community should be trying to do to make this more of an inclusive space. Yeah. As I was getting more and more into points and miles, I wanted to talk to other people about, hey, what's your strategy? Because there's definitely the stuff that you can find on the internet. And then there's the secret stuff where you have to know a guy in order to get that secret information. And I wanted that secret information. But if you ask people on Reddit, they're very mean. So they're going to make fun of you and it's not very accessible. And I couldn't find anybody like me to talk to about these types of things. And as I tried to do more of like the Instagram, I just noticed a lot of patterns. Like they are all white guys, like you mentioned, they all have blogs and The game is you write a lot of content for about two years or so before anybody even knows of your name. Then you go and beg Bankrate or somebody to give you affiliate links so that you can sell credit cards. And then suddenly you just start selling credit cards as your your income. And you never link to anybody else's blog because then your fan base might go to their fan base and then they'll use somebody else's affiliate links and you can only get so many credit cards. So you don't want to lose out on that affiliate income. And all of this together was creating an environment that was very competitive and made it almost impossible for any new people to rise up within this space and absolutely killed any diversity or inclusion. Because obviously there's all of the things like, oh, well, if women have to work more hours to make the same amount of pay. We're probably not going to have two years to just willy-nilly write a blog and then beg bank rate to give us some affiliate links. So all of that just made it really frustrating for me to even, one, find the next level information that I wanted, and then two, find friends in this space. So I just thought, what if I do the exact opposite 
of everyone else. I'm going to be not a white guy. Check that off really easily. I don't actually like writing. And these types of blogs are very technical and very difficult to write. So, And you need a staff to create enough content to make the ad space worth it. So I'm not going to make a blog. I'm just going to have a podcast where I talk with people. I'm not going to do the hyper competitive thing. I'm just going to invite everybody from the community onto my podcast. Anybody who wants to speak, share their story of a cool trip that they got to take, what they're doing. If they want to share their links, they can do so. And I will just promote everybody in the space. And instead of solely depending on affiliate links or income, I will make income in all of the ways. So I have affiliate link income. I have podcast ads. I have brand sponsorships on Instagram. I do coaching. I have master classes, lots of different streams of income. And I think that this has really, really helped with just showing that there can be more inclusivity in this space and it won't wreck your income. If you're one of those points and miles people who are trying to be hyper competitive and never let anybody from your audience see anybody else's links. Because I've gotten people who wrote in and said, hey, I'm Latina, Black, Asian, anything. And I've never heard somebody from my community talk about this before. So, and that's just really just life changing where we can show somebody, hey, points and miles isn't just for like the super tinkery white fintech bros who want to do Emirates first class, if you just want to see your mom in Honduras and you don't have $600, it can be for you too. And points and miles can be a really good way to learn about how the system of credit cards works and to get really nicely rewarded for getting that understanding. Yeah, I love that. And I think the work that you do is so important. That's why this whole idea of just like putting yourself out there and creating a community where one doesn't exist can be so powerful. So kudos to you for starting those conversations and and allowing people like us to even understand that like, yes, this is also something that you can do. Okay. So um, I think, you know, I'm inspired to continue to explore this world because I feel like there's just so much to learn. Um, what are some of your favorite resources besides your own podcast that you refer to when you're looking to learn more about uh, travel hacking? We have a really good Instagram community at this point. And I have a highlight on my Instagram, Geo Breeze Travel, where I just tag a lot of other people's stuff. And I featured a lot of them on the podcast. Please go check all of them out. They're amazing. As far as larger blogs that I like to follow, my two favorites are Frequent Miler and Doctor of Credit, which most people probably think of like the points guy as the main one that they think about. But that one's actually more good for travel inspiration, I would say, more than the actual deep points and miles knowledge anymore or like good promo offers. So Frequent Miler and Doctor of Credit are great. And I think there's also something to be said that they're a lot more honest. I found than a lot of other points blogs where with the Chase Sapphire Preferred, there was an offer where if somebody went into a bank and applied in branch, they would get their annual fee waived, which four of all of the big blogs mentioned. And Doctor of Credit actually did an article on who those four blogs were. But everyone else, all of the larger blogs, completely failed to mention this in into their audience. And there were actually some points and miles Facebook groups where if somebody said, hey, I saw this cool article about how if you go apply in branch, you can get your annual fee waived for the first year, their moderators would just delete it because they didn't want their following to go apply in branch because it would cost them the affiliate link. So I mm-hmm. think that just the business ethics of that were really questionable for that particular Facebook group. But two of my favorite channels that don't do shady things like that are Frequent Miler and Doctor of Credit. And then so many people on Instagram too are sharing the latest and greatest information. And some of them don't even have affiliate links. They just like to say, here's the best offers and you can follow all of them. Like I mentioned, there's so many and I don't want to like start giving shout outs to all of them because somebody's going to get mad that they got left (laughs) off. So all of you are in that Instagram highlight. Um, If you hear this podcast, everyone just go there. I love it. So Julia, for people who want to find out more about you, follow you on social, work with you, get coaching, where's the best place for us to find you? I'm mostly on Instagram at GeoBreeze Travel. And from there, you can can connect with me. You can sign up for coaching. 
I actually have a newsletter where I send a free coaching slot once a week. It goes really quickly. So whenever you get one of my emails, just make sure you open it and grab the free coaching call. I do monthly master classes because some people will ask questions about, well, how do you do this if you're a beginner? What's some good airline strategies, hotel strategies? What's the best ways to use different kinds of points and miles? So we have a lot of different master classes on that and they are all recorded and put in my Patreon for anybody who wants to do that. And all of the proceeds from those master classes just gets donated every month to a charity voted on by the Patreon. What else do I have? Obviously there's the podcast. We sometimes do different meetups in different cities. We had one in Chicago where more than 60 of us got to meet each other. Wow. We were just from the internet friends. So <laughs> lots of amazing. different ways to connect. Yeah. I love that. And it just goes to show the impact that you're having. I thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for the work that you're doing in this space. I can't wait to continue to follow your journey and see what's next for you. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Oh, and I have a gift for your listeners today. Um, if you would like my free hotel upgrade email template, which I've gotten to use all over the world, I got upgraded to a thousand dollar suite in Hawaii for that. And I've gotten a lot of other pretty great upgrades as well. Check out the show notes and there's a link to that template there. I love it. We've got all the hacks for you guys. So definitely check out the show notes. Follow Julia on Instagram at GeoBreeze Travel. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you are ready to take your dinero to the next level, sign up for our free 14-page guide, The Financially Lit Latina, the ultimate blueprint for becoming poderosa with your dinero. This 14-page guide includes our best tips on money mindset, budgeting, debt repayment, career, investing, financial independence, side hustles, and more. And you can get it completely free. So to get your copy of the Financially Lit Latina, just head over to YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com slash start. That's YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com slash start and start transforming your dinero story today. Until next time, stay empowered, stay inspired, and stay poderosa. On the Yo Quiero Dinero podcast and associated entities, all information provided is for general information purposes only and does not constitute accounting, legal, tax, or other professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the content or information found here without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. We assume no responsibility for information contained on this podcast and associated entities and disclaim all liability with respect to such information, including but not limited to any liability for errors, inaccuracies, omissions or misleading or defamatory statements. Usage of this podcast and associated contents constitutes an explicit understanding and acceptance of the terms of this disclaimer.